So our morning session, which was on personal interest discussion rooms, was not recorded. That was a private space. But we are recording and live streaming now for our final session, which is on research and innovation. So Jane Cherry from Australia is a member of our Retina International Youth Council, and she will be facilitating and leading this session. So I'm delighted to pass over to Jane directly. Jane, you're very welcome. Thanks, Fiona. So hi, everyone. I'm Jane, as Fiona said. I'm a member of the Retina International Youth Council and a member of Retina Australia as well. Um, so this is our research and innovation session. And I know for some of us living with IRD, it can seem like research is one of those things that happens uh, around us rather than something we're directly connected to. Um, however, patient involvement in research can have really positive impact. And studies have shown that contributions from patients on the design and the evaluation of research can lead to increased effectiveness. And also, um, Looking at the patient experience and assessing it gives a really unique uh, insight to research as well, because they get to look at their work from um, through a completely different lens. So if you're looking for ways to feel more connected and bridge that gap, um, some of the great ways to do that is staying connected with research news. And also, as you spoke about yesterday, um, getting involved with genetic testing. That's one of those really great ways to give yourself the best opportunity for a front row seat um, when clinical trials come up with your, you know, with our magic gene um, as the star, as the star of it. So um, not everything out there will necessarily be um, relevant to all of us, but it, there's just so much, um, there's so many advancements being made all the time. So it's really great to see what's out there and also just keep an eye on the leaps and bounds being made in research. So we thought today would be a really wonderful opportunity to show you some of the research projects that are out there and also to introduce you to some of the brilliant minds behind the research. So we'll start off um, by meeting Ben Shaberman. So Ben is Senior Director of Scientific Outreach at the Foundation, Foundation Fighting Blindness, excuse me. And Ben is gonna to talk to us about emerging therapies for retinal degenerative diseases that are in or approaching um, clinical trials. So we're really thrilled to have him here. Thank you. I know it's early for you, Ben, so I really appreciate you joining us. Thanks for putting the coffee on early to get up and be with us today. So. We'll have the presentation with Ben. We'll have an opportunity for questions afterwards. Um, but Ben, I'll hand over to you and you can fire away. Great, good. I'll say good morning, everybody. I realized it's morning for me. It's probably afternoon and evening for a lot of you. Uh, it's, it's a privilege and an honor to be the messenger of the, the um, great research that's going on, uh, not only in the US, but in Europe and around the world. Thanks for that very uh, apropos introduction, Jane. It is a very exciting time with so many uh, promising therapies in clinical trials and moving toward clinical trials. And just a, a little background, I'm with the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Um, I'm not a researcher, but my role is to report on the research. And we are celebrating our 50 year anniversary this year. So I assembled this uh, presentation, we're calling it 21 Cool Research Projects for 2021. And actually I've delivered variations on this uh, theme over the past year. And, add a few slides, subtract a few slides as, as the research changes. But I think one thing important to know is that while I'll be covering a lot of ground in the next 20 or so minutes, there are about 45 clinical trials currently underway. So there's a lot of great research I'm not able to cover just because of limited time, but, um, really regardless of your disease, your genetic mutation, your degree of vision loss, there's uh, a lot of great reasons to be hopeful as the science moves forward. So I'm gonna start off talking about gene therapy and I'm going to give you a couple examples of gene replacement therapy. And this really underscores why genetic testing is so important, trying to identify your mutated gene. Because with gene replacement therapy, the idea is you're replacing copies of that mutated gene, that defective gene, with healthy copies. Um, and we use 
a human engineered virus, which is like a container system to deliver those healthy copies to the retina. And what I wanted to highlight was a few different gene therapy trials that are underway for X-linked retinitis pigmentosa. This is a fairly common form of retinitis pigmentosa. And excitingly, there are three companies that are in phase three trials, are moving toward phase three trials for X-linked RP gene therapies. And there's a fourth company I'll talk about in a moment. But these three companies, AGTC, Biogen, and MiraGTX, have all reported vision improvements in their earlier stage clinical trials. So they're, uh, again, either in or moving toward phase three, which is the last phase before a company would seek regulatory approval. Now, uh, uh, an important thing to note is Biogen actually completed their phase two, three, and they didn't meet their endpoints, though they did report some vision improvements. So it's not clear whether they will move forward uh, with their treatment or not, but we do have these other options that are, uh, again, moving into phase three. Now, another company, 4D Molecular Therapeutics, 4DMT, is still in a phase one, two. What's a little different about their approach is they inject the therapy into the middle of the eye instead of underneath the retina. Their approach is potentially less invasive, which is a good thing. <laughs> Subretinal injections or surgery, uh, 4DMT's approach really isn't. And we'll wait to see how their um, therapy performs in their early stage clinical trial. And as my slide indicates, there are about 20,000 people in the US who have X-linked RP. So moving on to another uh, promising gene therapy that's in the clinic. This is being developed by Etsina Therapeutics. It's a new company. Actually, it's part of the foundation's Venture Philanthropy Fund portfolio. Uh, Etsina was founded by Shannon Boy at the University of Florida and her husband, Sanford. This is a gene therapy for people with mutations in the gene GUCY2D. It's a long gene name, but when it's mutated, it causes labor congenital amaurosis. So in their phase one, two, they reported some encouraging early results for the first three patients. And now they're moving their treatment into uh, patients using a higher dose and patients with better vision. So hopefully they'll get even better results. Now, Shannon is also developing a gene therapy for Usher syndrome type 1B. And what's special about this particular gene therapy is it's designed for genes that are big and don't normally fit into the viral containers that are typically used in human gene therapies, these AAV containers. So her approach is to split the gene into two pieces. So it's put into two containers. And then when the containers reach the retina, the genes are recombined, so you have a full gene. So we call this a dual vector container system. And what's exciting about this is not only is it applicable to USH1B, but potentially other large genes like ABCA4, which when mutated causes Stargardt disease and also USH2A. And I'll apologize, there's a truck going by outside my window. I don't know if you can hear it. Um, the garbage men are working hard this morning. That's all I, I, I can say about that. So let's move on to some more gene replacement therapies. All of these, which are being developed by Iveric Bio, are still at a preclinical stage. Um, but these are all exciting projects. Three of the projects uh, for the gene CEP290, which is associated with LCA, ABCA4, which is a Stargardt disease gene, and USH2A, which when mutated causes Usher syndrome type 2A or non-syndromic RP. These are all these larger genes that I was talking about in the previous slide 
that don't fit into the viral containers that we normally use right now. But what Iveric Bio's partners are doing is they are shrinking these genes so they can fit into the viral containers. It's a different approach as opposed to the dual vector approach. We call these mini genes. And again, these are all moving toward the clinic. Now, Iveric Bio is also developing a gene therapy for the rhodopsin gene, which when mutated causes a pretty common form of autosomal dominant RP. What's challenging about this gene is uh, rhodopsin causes the production of a toxic protein. So you have to knock down the gene in addition to replacing it. So it's a two-step process. It's not just replacement, it's knocking down the mutated copy of the gene. So we're excited about that. And then finally, out of all these gene therapies, the one that's most likely to move into the clinic um, soonest, and that would be um, at the end of the year, or early, F, early calendar uh, 22, would be the gene for best disease, which is an inherited form of macular degeneration. So I've given you an overview of a lot of different gene replacement therapies. There are many more either moving toward the clinic or already in the clinic. But now we're going to move to some different concepts that are gene related. And this particular concept is gene editing. And instead of replacing the whole gene, gene editing through this approach we call CRISPR-Cas9 is not replacing the gene, it's going in and cutting out the mutation so that the gene can operate normally. And that's basically what CRISPR-Cas9 is. Uh, this approach can also be used to insert a new piece of DNA into that existing gene. So again, it functions normally. You can think of, of CRISPR-Cas9 as like cut and paste or a pair of molecular scissors to address the mutation. Now, excitingly, um, the company Editas, Editas launched the first CRISPR-Cas9 therapy applied to any part of the human body um, several months ago. We're fortunate that it happens to be in the retina. They're addressing a pretty common mutation in CEP290. Um, we've heard some encouraging anecdotal reports from this trial, but we're waiting to hear uh, the formal report from Editas, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. They are also developing CRISPR-Cas9 therapies for USH2A, a region called exon 13 in that um, gene, as well as a common mutation in the rhodopsin gene, which again, uh, when mutated, causes RP. And I will add that the Foundation Fighting Blindness has six or seven CRISPR projects in its portfolio. Those are not yet in the clinic. Let me make sure I go back here. So we're going to talk about yet another approach to addressing a genetic mutation. And we call the, the approach uh, on this slide, we call this um, an RNA therapy or RNA therapies. So your genetic material, your DNA is like a library of code in your cell. But there's a messaging system also that transfers information from that library through your cell so that cr the correct proteins can be made. And that uh, messaging system, the messages we refer to as RNA. And so there are companies that are developing therapies that address the mutation that are in these messages, these are these um, uh, messenger RNA. And we again, we call these RNA therapies. Procure, a company in the Netherlands, is developing what we call antisense oligonucleotides. Very long, complicated name. But you can think of their therapy as this tiny piece of genetic material that covers up the region 
in the RNA that needs to be masked. And once you do that, the cell can make a functional protein. So again, think of this, this approach as a tiny piece of genetic material to cover up the mutated region or the region that needs to be covered up so that a normal protein can be uh, produced by the cell. So Procure has three clinical trials underway, one for SEP290, that's in phase 2-3, one for USH2A exon 13, that's moving toward a phase 2-3. Both of these trials have reported some pretty nice vision results, so we're excited. And we're um, hopeful that we'll see additional positive results in these later stage trials so that eventually Procure can seek regulatory approval for this approach. Procure also has a phase one, two for RP, the uh, common rhodopsin mutation, uh, P23H. That's in a phase one, two. They have not reported results for that just yet, so stay tuned. A lot of great work. Uh, being conducted by Procure, and I'm pleased to say the Foundation Fighting Blindness is investing in the USH2A um, project. Moving on, we're still going to talk about gene therapy here. We're actually we're going to go back to gene therapy, but this is a gene agnostic approach. So this is designed to work regardless of the mutated gene causing the retinal disease. So whether you know your gene, or even if there's not an approach addressing your gene, when you do know it, this may be applicable to you. And the idea here is the gene therapy expresses a protein that keeps cones healthy. It's being developed by Sparing Vision out of France, the Institut de la Vision. And cones are important because they give us central vision and the, the uh, ability to read and recognize faces and see colors and see things in lighted conditions. We use cones for our activities of daily living where rods are important, but they give us night vision and peripheral vision. So if we can save cones in people, we can preserve some meaningful vision. So this gene therapy is still in a preclinical stage. We're hoping it can move into a clinical trial next year. Uh, the company is targeting people with RP and Usher syndrome and potentially related conditions. So this is sparing vision out of France. Stay tuned. So we're gonna move on to yet another approach um, that we consider to be a gene therapy, but this too is gene agnostic. And the idea here is to help people with the most advanced vision loss. For people who have lost all their rods and cones or most of their rods and cones to conditions like RP, Usher syndrome, and even down the road, Stargardt disease and AMD. And there are a few companies now that have clinical trials underway for this approach, uh, which we call optogenetics. And the idea here is for people who have lost all their rods and cones, and therefore all their vision, that we're gonna use different cells in the retina as a backup system to restore vision. And these can be ganglion cells and even bipolar cells which survive after photoreceptors have been um, lost to advanced disease. Now, ganglion cells and bipolar cells normally don't respond to light. But what this gene therapy does is it delivers a gene that bestows light sensitivity to these ganglion cells or these bipolar cells. And there are three companies that now have clinical trials underway for this approach. I'm highlighting Bionic Sight on this slide. Earlier this year, they reported uh, vision improvements for four people um, at the very early stage. It's actually the first four people 
uh, treated in their clinical trial, which is underway in the US and Long Island outside of New York City. And these folks who had really no vision, just light perception, were able to see shapes and motion, just examples of what these people were able to see. Um, one gentleman saw the Hanukkah candles um, during the uh, holiday in December when he couldn't see them before. Um, two other people that practice martial arts were able to see their opponents, the contrast of their opponents against the mat that they were practicing on. So this is very early stage research. People still can't read and see details, but we're hopeful that as this approach moves forward, people will have better vision. We're still learning a lot about this approach. And GenSight and both Bionic Sight, their approach employs goggles or glasses to enhance the visual information coming into the retinas that have been treated by these gene therapies. There's another company, Nanoscope, that just uh, announced that their approach has been um, moved into a clinical trial in the US. We're hoping that that approach shows some promise. They're claiming that their approach will work under a broader range of lighting conditions. We'll see how that goes. They had some early encouraging results in India. But again, the cool thing here, it's designed for people who have lost really all their vision and it is gene agnostic. So I wanna move into some cell therapies and there are multiple cell therapies in clinical trials, j site Reneuron, but I decided to cover an approach that is really cool because instead of transplanting or injecting cells into the retina, as most um, approaches uh, are designed to do, this approach we call the grow your own. This approach being developed by Tom Ray at the University of Washington is designed to enable a person with advanced retinal disease to grow their own new retinal cells from Mueller glia. And what Dr. Ray learned from studying amphibians and fish um, is that these animals can regenerate their own um, retinas. They can regenerate their tails. If they lose their tails, they can re regenerate their feet and their fins and things like that. So he's trying to um, uh, empower humans to be able to do the same things in their retinas. And he's designing a small molecule that in mice has enabled what are called Mueller glia cells to sprout photoreceptors. So he's done it in mice and, and fish, and now he's working on it in a large animal model. It's not ready for prime time yet. It's not ready for humans, but this large animal study is an important step toward moving it toward humans. And this again is an approach that's being funded by the Foundation Fighting Blindness. And what's nice again is you wouldn't have to transplant new cells in, which makes it a lot easier, less invasive, and less chance of immune rejection if the patient can sprout their own new photoreceptors. So finally, to conclude here, I just wanted to review some treatments that are um, in the clinic for people with Stargardt disease, which is a pretty common form of inherited macular degeneration. So in Stargardt disease, the hallmark is the toxic, the buildup of these toxic byproducts from vitamin A processing. We all need vitamin A for our retinas to work properly. Vitamin A makes our retinas light sensitive. Vitamin A is metabolized in the retina to bestow that light sensitivity. But when it's metabolized, there are byproducts that we can call these waste products that need to be cleared from the retina. 
And in people with Stargardt disease, these byproducts accumulate in a cell layer called the RPE cells. So companies are trying to find ways to reduce the accumulation of these toxic byproducts. So a company called Alkius has designed a form of vitamin A, it's called deut deuterated vitamin A, that quote unquote is metabolized more cleanly than vitamin A that we get from our diets. And actually this has been in a phase two clinical trial and they've completed that phase two. Um, they haven't formally reported results. They sort of leaked some results for a while um, at a conference earlier this year. Those results were encouraging. They're waiting to report more formal results um, with some other announcements. And hopefully that will move into a phase three. Now, another uh, company, Iveric Bio, that I was actually talking about earlier, they have a treatment called Zamora that is targeting the immune system to hopefully slow down the progression of Stargardt disease. In addition to this vitamin A problem, uh, researchers have found that the immune system is overactive in people with a lot of retinal diseases, including Stargardt disease. And the part of the immune system that's overactive is called the complement system. So their treatment, which is injected into the eye, is designed to inhibit the complement system. This is in a phase two trial um, in the US and Europe. They have not reported results yet, but stay tuned for that. And then finally, a company that we're funding as part of our venture philanthropy portfolio is called Stargazer. And what their treatment is designed to do, it's a small molecule, is reduce the uptake of vitamin A into the retina so that there is less of this toxic byproduct that I was talking about uh, that's produced. This is in, actually they completed phase two and now they're planning on moving toward the later stage trial, the phase three. So stay tuned for that. A lot of great work going on for uh, Stargardt disease. So again, that's me going quickly through a lot of projects. The good news is there's a lot more. Uh, in the pipeline, both in the clinic and moving toward the clinic. You can learn about these um, projects and many more projects by visiting our website, fightingblindness.org. There's a website called clinicaltrials.gov, which lists all the clinical trials underway in the US and really most of the trials underway in Europe. So you can learn a lot about human clinical trials there. And then finally, as you heard yesterday, um, My Retina Tracker, our patient registry, which is at myretinatracker.org, is a great resource for getting on the radar screen of researchers around the world that are conducting clinical trials. So you can learn about clinical trials for which you may qualify. So that finishes up my talk. Again, thanks everybody for uh, allowing me to participate in this conference. Uh, it's a real privilege and an honor to do so. So I hand it back to you, Jane. Thank you so much, Ben. That's brilliant. It's, it's a really optimistic view of the future, I think, um, looking at everything that's underway and that just being a snapshot of it. Um, we've got some time for questions, if um, anyone has got any. Um, and I'm assuming there's going to be a lot, but before the hands fly up, I was just wondering, Ben, in terms of um, all these creative methods can people come up with, does it start with the method and then apply to the gene, or does the gene sometimes dictate the method that can be used? It, it definitely does. So a real short course on genes. Genes are code for the production of proteins in our retina. And and proteins throughout the rest of our body for that ma matter. And it's the proteins that are really important to the function of our retina and the health and well-being. But each protein plays a different role. 
So some proteins are necessary for the development of our rods and cones. Some genes are important for bestowing lights or some proteins are important for bestowing light sensitivity to our retinas. Some are important for vitamin A processing. So depending on which gene is mutated and then what protein is missing or isn't produced correctly, that dictates the approach that we need to use to address the mutation. And each, again, each gene plays a different role. So um, as you're asking, yes, each different gene, the way it's mutated will dictate the approach that, that we need to, to use to address these conditions. And in, an important thing that the foundation fighting blindness is focused on is, is having a broad range of treatments to address the, the myriad ways that mutated genes can affect the health and well-being of the retina. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Marina, you've got your hand up. We've got a question for Ben. Uh, yes, hello. Hello, Jane. Hello, Ben. Thank you very much. Your presentation was uh, amazing. Uh, I would like to talk uh, about, I would like to ask you about Acucella research uh, for Stargard disease. Can you uh, talk a little bit about it, please? Thank you. Sure. So Acucella is a company, a company similar in some ways to the companies that I highlighted on that last slide. They're developing a treatment for Stargard disease. Um, the idea is to reduce the uptake of vitamin A into the retina. So there is less of the byproduct that's toxic that's produced and, and causing damage. I know they are in a later stage clinical trial for Stargardt disease. They've been in that stage for a while and they have not reported results. So I'm honestly not sure what is um, happening in that particular trial um, because they have not reported results, at least that I'm aware. Um, so I, I apologize that I don't have further information. Um, but again, the good news is there are a lot of uh, companies that are addressing a similar pathway. Thanks, Ben. And Oswaldo, I can see a hand up from you. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for the presentation, Ben. It was really interesting. So I noticed that uh, most of the trials and, and projects are gene therapy or gene related. And you did mention, uh, I think, two that were just small molecule, uh, small molecule uh, uh, approaches. So I'm wondering uh, why uh, there seems to be a focus on gene, uh, since uh, you know these are such uh, heterogeneic uh, 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 diseases. Uh, very hard to it can be very hard to point to uh, what gene is having a defect, etc. So what what are what's the reason why uh, people seem to focus on gen, gene therapies? And also, uh, do you think there are benefits to uh, to gene versus small molecules uh, and vice versa? Sure, it's a a really good question, and I want to emphasize that the sparing vision approach designed to save cones, the optogenetic approaches that I talked about. Um, the stem cell approach where you can grow your own stem cells and then trials like Reneuron and j -Site, those are all cell-based. Those are all gene agnostic. So there's a lot of great work going on that is designed to work independent of the mutated gene. And that's a really important focus of the foundation fighting blindness. With that mm -hmm. said, there is also a lot of great work going on that's gene specific. And the reason for that is the mutated gene is really the root, the root cause of the disease. So if you can replace the gene, if you can 
snip out the mutation or cover up the mutation, you're really getting at the root cause of the disease. And that's one of the reasons gene specific approaches are um, targeted by many companies. But again, there are many uh, gene agnostic approaches. Our, our portfolio, I, I would say, is pretty balanced with both, both approaches. And one last comment I'll make, um, and I didn't talk about this because it's been around a while, but is the Luxterna gene therapy for people with RPE65 mutations. That gene therapy was approved in um, uh, approved by the regulators in, almost four years ago. It's provided dramatic vision improvements for people with RPE65 mutations. And it was really a message to therapy developers that gene-specific approaches can really effectively address um, these conditions. But again, there's plenty of gene agnostic approaches out there as well. Good question. Thank you. Thanks, Susanna, and thank you, Ben. I can see another hand up, but I'm afraid we're going to have to um, close up the session now because we have to move on to our next segment. But Ben, I'll thank you again on behalf of the Youth Council for joining us today so early, and I hope you have a relaxing morning ahead of you now. <laughs> We've got you out of bed so early. Well, thank you. Again, honor and a privilege, um, and good luck to you all, and thank you for the great work of Retina International. Uh, we appreciate it here in, in the U.S. Thanks so much, Ben. Thank you. So we're going to now stuff have our um, Ask Me Anything type session with our um, five PhD researchers. So they're going to talk to us about their research projects, how they came to work in IRDs, and about patient involvement in their research. So we have five joining us. We've got Meltem Kutla, so PhD candidate from Izmir in Turkey. We've got Amelia Zinn, who's starting a postdoctoral research position at the L'Institut de la Vision in Paris. Uh, Laura Whelan, a third year PhD candidate from Dublin. Oswaldo Perez, Oswaldo is Norwegian, but born in Venezuela and started his PhD project at the Research Institutes of Sweden. And we have Gavin Arno, um, gained his PhD from St. George's University of London. So welcome to you all. It's really nice to have you here and thank you for joining us. And I've got Marina Lecce here as well um, to help with moderating the questions. Um, so I'll kick off with a couple of questions, but please um, feel free to use the raise hand function, Alt Y on your keyboards to get involved. Um, Hi, Jane. Just a quick interruption. If oh, I'll, I'll just last night. Apologies, was just spotlighting the other thing. Okay, no worries, it's got everyone together now, excellent. Um, so we also got some great questions through the, uh, the registration process, so thank you for sending them through in advance. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's a very informal Ask Me Anything, so we'll throw it open to you guys with your raised hands um, as soon as you're ready. But I'll, um, I'll kick off first, if that's all right. So question for all of you, um, can I ask why you chose a path in eye health and specifically um, retina. So I, I'll start. Um, Gavin's next to me on screen, so I'll start with you, Gavin, if you don't mind. Hi, uh, nice to meet you all. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I, I feel a bit out of place. I'm not actually very young at all. I'm uh, I got my PhD in 2007, so I'm I'm a lot older than all of you. But anyway, so I my PhD was actually in uh, something completely different. It was in immunology and uh, coronary artery disease. But from there, I, uh, I moved across to human genetics and Mendelian disease research. And that really is my first love now. That's, that's what I really enjoy doing. And uh, for me, retinal dystrophy genetics is the, is the perfect um, organ or, or model for studying inherited diseases. And that's really because um, with the retina, we have the, the opportunity to be able to functionally test the cells that are affected by disease in vivo, so in, in live patients, which we, we don't really have for any other organ systems in the body. We can see the cells, we can look at the back of the eye, see the affected cells, test them with electrophysiology and see exactly what's happening and relate that to the genetics that we're studying. 
And so that's that's why I chose retinal dystrophy um, genetics as, as my research area. And I've been working on retinal dystrophy genetics and genomics now for about nine or 10 years nearly now at the Institute of Ophthalmology in, in London. And so during that time, we've, we've seen huge advances in how we can study genetics. We, so when I first started doing research into Mendelian diseases, if we were looking at a large gene like ABCA4, which has 50 exons, it would take us a long time and a lot of work in the lab to be able to sequence that gene and look for the mutations. And now we're able to do a genome sequencing assay in, in you know days, if not hours, and then analyze that data very, very quickly. So in the time since I got my PhD, we're now moving from, from reading sequences at, at, at a rate of 200 base pairs per experiment to the whole genome, which is which is three billion nucleotides in one in one experiment. So you know for me now is a really, really exciting time to be interested in genetics and genomics and the fact that our work is leading to these um, development of gene therapies and, and uh, you know, targeting different mutations, that's, that just makes it even more exciting. So that's why I found retinal dystrophy genetics and that's why I'll stay in this field for the rest of my career now. It's not like I'm funded. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there'll be another amazing leap in the next 10 years as well. Um, Laura, I'll come to you next. Same question. Yeah, um, I feel like Gavin covered a lot of it there. <laughs> um, I guess I was just always interested in genetics, um, especially I knocked something over. Um, I was always interested in genetics, um, especially in my final years in school. Um, I had a biology teacher who was just totally enthused by genetics. So um, I decided to, to study human genetics at college. And through that then, um, I had lectures on inherited retinal disease. And it seemed like the ideal place to be in if you wanted to get into genomics and get into studying genetics as a career, um, just because of the heterogeneity that we talked about and what's going on in the field of gene therapy. Um, so yeah, just an absolute love for genetics um, made me choose this field. Excellent. Thank you. Amelia? Hi, yes. Um, hi. Um, yeah, I, I also, um, my, my path into this field was a little bit different in the sense that I was interested in, in neuroscience. Um, so um, I, as an undergrad, ended up joining a lab that was a neuroscience lab, neurogenesis lab, and they used retina as a model. And out of all the projects that they were working on, um, there was a postdoc working on gene therapy in, um, using, um, she was basically working, looking at glaucoma and thinking of using gene therapy with glaucoma. And I thought that was super interesting, got involved with the project, and that was 11 years ago, and I'm still working with gene therapy now. So, um, and hopefully we'll keep working with it uh, for the rest of my career too. <laughs> so I'm getting the sense from a lot of you that's quite an addictive <laughs> drop once you get started. Um, so as Walter, to you. Uh, yeah, so I'm a PhD student, uh, actually colleague with, with Meltem, she's my colleague. Uh, and uh, I've, I, I'm, a, I'm a chemist, actually, to be clear. Uh, I've always been interested in biology and, and chemistry and natural sciences and anatomy also. And uh, also since I was a kid, I come from a, a Venezuela where everyone has brown eyes. And every time I saw someone with colored eyes, I would, you know, I was really interested by that. So, um, yeah, uh, somehow that was always there. I didn't choose this project because of uh, the retina, uh, retinal research. Just the project in general was very interesting, but uh, every, uh, I'm fascinated by everything we're learning. And I hope I here to stay just everything really fell together. So I'm lucky, lucky to be here, I think. Okay. Thanks, Isoto. And Melton? Hello, everyone. We are a, with a lot of young people today, and I would like to start a little bit early to story. And when I was a high school, uh, high school student, you know, I was really interested in biology. And for this reason, I chose the um, uh, biology department for my bachelor degree. 
However, when I was in the second year of my bachelor, I was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa in Turkey. And I searched about it to learn deeper. And I couldn't find too much deep information about it. Also, I searched a research group who is doing the experiment, doing the research, doing the clinical trial about it. And I couldn't find it. It was 2009. And in that moment, it's my motivation also. I decided to focus on my career to do research about retinitis pigmentosa. And right now, I am the PhD student in Italy um, to be a molecular biologist and uh, doing the research about my disease, retinitis pigmentosa. And right now, I didn't know my gene, which is important. Still, like the, as a patient, I'm trying to learn my gene a mutated gene, and also I, as a researcher, I am working on it. This is the motivation for me to choose the retinal disease. That's really brilliant. So, like Mel, do any of you um, have any personal experience with IRD? So, anyone, friends, family, anyone with the condition, or is it introduce your patients now? Okay, well, you know all of us now, so now you're connected to everyone here. So can I ask what um, projects you guys are working on at the moment? And if anyone wants to jump in first, we'll just go around the room. So I, I can start if you like. So we, I, I'm working on um, defining the missing heritability in, in retinal dystrophy genes so using whole genome sequencing and uh, other advanced genomic methods such as long read sequencing to try and find the missing causes of retinal dystrophy. So we know that we know that there are over 250 genes that cause retinal dystrophies. And we know that uh, current genetic testing, depending on the laboratory and the country and the method used, can find somewhere between 50 and 70% of the, of the genes and the mutations that cause disease. But we need to we need to work harder to find the missing causes, and that's what we're doing now. We're looking at uh, new genes, um, variations, and mutations outside of genes, outside of the coding region, regions of the genes, regulatory regions, and large structural rearrangements and that kind of thing, to find um, those causes. Sorry, my kid. It's getting a bit loud in the background to find the causes of uh, of disease that we haven't been able to define yet and to improve the molecular diagnostics that we already have so that's that's the aim of my project okay um anyone want to go next or just go around the room again laura yeah um i work as part of a project called target 5000 and target 5000 is the irish national registry for inherited retinal diseases so just like gavin we work on sequencing patients with inherited retinal disease um, to try and find what particular uh, variants in what particular genes um, are causing the phenotype or the inherited retinal disease um a lot of my work specifically focusing on me and my project and not the project as a whole. Um, I work on looking at variants that impact a process called splicing, which is the way in which bits of genes come together to form the protein at the end. Um, so a lot of my work is doing functional assays or experiments in the lab to try and figure out if certain DNA changes affect that process. Um, but I also have a pretty keen interest in kind of Irish population genetics and how common these certain variants are at a base level in our population. So that's another thing that I look into as well. Yeah, keep it nice and personal. Uh, Amelia? Hi, yeah, I, I actually just started my postdoc. Um, I'm gonna be working with optogenetics in the retina, gene therapy, but um, since I just started, I don't have much to say at the, about that project just yet. But during my PhD, I was working with uh, gene replacement therapy for a type of uh, neuronal steroid lipofusinosis, um, CLN11. Um, so I was basically um, working with uh, that gene and, and a small animal model in mice and trying to deliver that gene to mice and seeing if I could um, prevent the degeneration from happening. So yeah, that was my PhD. That sounds really exciting. Oswaldo, what are you working on at the moment? Uh, maybe Melvin can go first. I don't know. What do you think, Madam? 
Why not? Uh, actually, we are trying to mimic the retinal degeneration with the cells, with the retina cells. They are a kind of pre-retina cells. And we are mimicking the mutation is affected the road photoreceptors. The mutation name is PD6. And we achieve it so far and we publish it actually. And the idea is here to mimic the retinal degeneration with the cells is to have a system to test the drug candidate really faster, easier and economic way. For this reason, we are working on this model. It's working right now. But we need the best candidates, drug candidates. And the drug candidates come from the Oswaldo. Maybe Oswaldo can continue after me. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, we, we, we're part of kind of the same project, uh, even though we're working on two different things. And the general uh, goal of our project is we're trying to, uh, uh, we have this uh, molecule, small molecule, if Ben is here still, that's why I was asking about that. But a small molecule that we hope can help treat uh, retinal degenerations. And so I'm the chemist and what, what I'm doing is uh, developing a process or a, a synthesis uh, that is upscalable that we can use to uh, deliver large amounts of, of this promising molecule so that people can melt them, can, uh, people like melt them can test them. Brilliant, wow. Really exciting stuff. So looking at the patient element of your work, have you have any of you had much experience working involving patients in your research and seen any um, benefits or um, any sort of additional insights through involving patients with your research? I, I don't mind talking again first. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dive in. So the patients, um, so I work with patients at Moorfields Eye Hospital in London and uh, really, you know, everything we're doing is focused on trying to benefit the patients and trying to feed back molecular diagnoses to patients and families. And we really, you know, we, we have an amazing group of patients at Moorfields and, um, you know, they're, they're very, very collaborative um, as are all of the families that I've interacted with, really. They're very collaborative. They're very keen to help our studies and to, you know, they work really hard tracking down family members and, and getting blood samples and saliva samples for us to do family testing and, and sort of thing. So we work very closely with our patients and uh, they are the focus of all of our work. So, you know, without them, we can't do anything, essentially. So as a molecular geneticist it, it's important i think to recognize um that that uh, you know the patients are the center of all of this and to to be able to understand how the gene relates to not only the clinical phenotype not only what we see in the imaging and and how the retina is disrupted but what that actually means for the day-to-day -day life of the uh, of the patients and the families and that's you know, I, I enjoy working closely with, with patients and interacting with them and, and talking with patient groups all the time. So it's a really important part of my work, particularly. Yeah, that's really nice to hear. And I think that's encouraging for all of us to um, get involved where we can, because, yeah, like you said, it's, it's based around us. And um, so it's nice to hear that, you know, the research being developed with us at the centre. Um, does anyone have any other Anything to add to that? Okay, I'll just a reminder to anyone. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Maybe I don't know. Okay, I'll well, follow first you, please. Very short. Maybe just to contrast, because I don't have any experience, the close experience with patients. You know, I'm just in the lab, uh, uh, caught up in my chemistry, you know, trying to develop things uh, for manufacturing. But that being said, uh, I do, having the perspective of, of what is beneficial for a patient, uh, we learned about this uh, and that's very helpful for me and uh, um, for example the we, we know what the candidate drug candidate is but uh, it's important to develop the 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 physical uh, form of the molecule not just the chemical form but the physical form uh, 
because that affects whether we can inject it or how long uh, it can be in the eye. And that affects uh, how often the patient needs to be injected if, if uh, this is an injection with the work of So uh, that, that's, uh, that's very helpful for me to have that perspective. Yeah. Milton? Milton? Yes, actually, we are not directly working with the patient, but it's really important to be connected with the patient organization. Because as a researcher, we need the support to extend our work. Uh, we need more younger researchers to do more experiments, more research. So working together, it's really important. For this reason, as a Transmed Consortium, we are also working with Retina International to explain what we are doing uh, in the lab as a young researcher also what we can do for the future. So all together, we are more strong, more powerful to extend the all research uh, projects. And this is important, not maybe just only work with the patient, uh, also the work together for every step of the research. Yeah, that's right. So when you connect through Retina Australian institutions like that, do you ever find that research is sort of overlaps, like so similar things are being worked on in different locations? And are there, are there ways to collaborate on projects, you know, when you see similar streams or is it more you can sort of focus on what you're doing and people can work sort of in tandem rather than together? So I, I think there's there's a, a, a real need for researchers to to collaborate more widely and work together more. And you know, genetics unfortunately has a history of being very very competitive and uh, secretive, and and that's based on you know the the history of the field of genetics where people were chasing the discovery of genes and, and many groups around the world would be would be looking for the same gene essentially and, and com competing against each other. And I think now um, with the advent of the, you know, the genomic revolution and, and, and whole genome sequencing, I think there's a there's been a real step change in the way that genetics is done and the way that we work together more now. So, so you know, we're, we're all part of, or molecular geneticists, we're all part of large um, international collaborations as a European retinal dystrophy um, consortium, which uh, I think Laura is, is a part of as well, um, which brings together researchers from, from over 20 different groups across Europe. Um, all sharing data, which is the really key thing that we need to do to, to, to be able to advance the field now, is to share data, share findings, and work on these things together. Um, so there is a, there is a, a push towards that now, and, and to, you know, um, leave behind the old competitive days of research. So that's my feeling, anyway. Yeah, that's good to hear. So... Just from the audience, are there any questions you have for any of the researchers here? Because I'll just keep talking all day if you let me. And so will I. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff, I, have a, oh. I have a question. <laughs> it's Marina here, Marina Leite. Uh, so thank you all for joining us in this event. Uh, I'd like to hear from you uh, what's uh, your point of view, uh, what you think about how patients can get involved in research uh, due to your experience? Uh, what would be your advice for patients uh, who wants to get involved in research and how can we do this in, uh, in a good way? I don't mind jumping in here a little bit. Um, one thing that we were thinking about lately, which I think would be great, is to get patients involved in, you know, um, the kind of dissemination or sharing stage of the research when um, we have results that we want to share. And, you know, you go to academic conferences and you share these results and you're sharing them with other researchers, obviously. Um, but it would be great to share them with patients more as well um, and also share them in a way that is approachable to everyone because you can get kind of lost in the science sometimes, I think. Um, so I think that if, you know, patients want to reach out and email and say they'd love to be involved in something like that, I definitely think that's something that um, we could do. 
That sounds brilliant. Yeah, because I, I mean, I think a lot when I started looking for um, stuff on retinitis pigmentosa, a lot of the medical journals were coming up, which just flew way over my head. So something in more layman accessible terms, is, um, yeah, it would be brilliant to read through. Uh, I, I want to echo that, uh, uh, you know, the dissemination part, because uh, uh, on, from the, from the uh, pure chemistry or, or scientific point of view, maybe the chemistry that I'm doing is very simple. So in a conference, it might not be as uh, catching uh, as eye catching or as important to other scientists. Uh, you know, the, the importance might be lost in translation. So uh, helping other people see how this is important uh, is, is, well, it's important. Uh, just to add to what Laura said, um, so there are projects like uh, My Retina Tracker and, and uh, similar um, similar uh, projects around the world that are trying to put um, patients in control of their data and, we, and we've been working on one at Moorfields for a, a couple of years now called My Eyesight um, which is which is aiming really to to put all of the data into the hands of the patients and the families so the genomic data that we that we generate to to, to be able to give control of that patients and the imaging data, which makes it much easier for patients then to be able to share that data with different clinicians, with different researchers, and to, to really help with the, with the uh, collaboration and, and sharing of data. Because at the moment, you know, in the UK, it's very, very difficult for us to see um, retinal imaging data from a different hospital. It's, it's incredibly complicated for that to be shared across the NHS. And so if we can empower patients and patient groups to be able to do that, to, to take control of that, then that will really help the research and it will put, uh, you know, it will, it will help um, give, give people more information about their disease, about their genetics and so on. So I think, you know, projects like that, and there are several going all on um, around the globe, will, uh, will, you know, a good way for, for people to step into uh, into the world of, uh, of their retinal genetics studies and, and to, to get information about their disease and put them in contact with research groups. Yeah. So it's worth looking that sort of thing up. Yeah, so I was just thinking Fiona might um, be giving me the wind up signal soon. <laughs> <laughs> I am indeed. Um, so we are just at time. I'd like, really like to thank you. So Jane, if you'd like to wrap things up. Yeah, and I just want to say on behalf of the council, thank you so much for um, for speaking with us all and sharing your stories. I think it's really heartening to hear people so passionate about working in something that affects all of our lives. And I feel like we're in very safe hands seeing all these bright minds come through in research. So thank you again. And yeah, I will hand over. I will stop talking and hand back to um, Marina or Fiona to wrap us up. Thank you so much. Um, so yes, really great to hear all your insights and to make these connections. Um, and I look forward to speaking with each of you, and maybe exploring more ways where we can increase this interaction with young researchers and young people and young patients across our global community. Thank you all. I'll bid you adieu. And yeah. so. Before I pass over to Marina, who has some final comments, the interim chair, uh, what I would really like to do is get a group photo. So I'd like to invite everyone, if you'd like to participate in the group photo, to please turn your videos on. You can do this with Alt-V. Um, if you don't want to participate in the photo, that's no problem. And you can simply leave your video off you another few moments. It's just again, it's Alt V for the videos. And we're all coming alive, fixing our hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay. So let me just set up my screens here. Just Final note, if you want to join, it's Alt-V to activate your videos. All right. And
and I am taking the photo in three, two, one. Fantastic. And another one, three, two, one. Thank you all so much. And I'm going to pass over to Marina now, who has some final comments for us. I'm mute or not? You are live. Wonderful. So I want to say a huge thank you to all the researchers, everyone who has presented, all the youth council members who have participated. It was a crazy five weeks and an amazing two days. All the work was worth it. So thank you for tuning in wherever in the world you are. And we look forward to you joining us in our future ventures. So that everyone is aware, next year, so 2022, we will be having the International World Congress for Retina International. It is taking place in Iceland in July. So if you want to get involved in the youth program, which is like a two, three day in-person meetup around the count around the actual conference, you are very welcome to join us. Not mandatory, but always it's always really good. And then I want to speak to the fact of if you have heard all this and gone, wow, I really want to get involved, then I will remind you that Retina International has global affiliates. Retina New Zealand, Retina Australia, Retina Suisse for Switzerland, Pro Retina in Germany, the list goes on and on. I encourage you as a patient, as a supporter, as a health professional, find your affiliate, see if they are already working with Retina. And if they're not, ask them why not? Get them moving. The more people we have involved, the more we can achieve for our members. So if you want to be a voting member on the council, your affiliate has to be a full member. If you want to just participate in projects like this, you just need to be a candidate member. Each country can nominate two people. So if you're interested, remember, advocate, be the voice, be the change you want to see in the world today and tomorrow. And with that, I will hand back to Fiona and wish you all a fantastic morning, evening, afternoon. And may the inspiration stay with you and drive you forward to your next point of participation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marina, for those great words of closing. Uh, I would just like to pass my thanks to our working group for the Retina International Youth Council. Um, they've done amazing work. This event was, our council was only set up really at the beginning of July and really incredible work was done to pull this conference together. Um, so huge thank you to all of you. Huge thank you to Marina, our interim chair and our other Marina, who was the coordinator for this working group. And to all our speakers and participants, it was fantastic. And thank you, of course, to all our attendees who stuck with us through the end. Um, and as Marina said, we look forward to welcoming as many of you as possible in Iceland 2022. Um, these recordings will be made available uh, as soon as possible. And, and yes, please do reach out if you have any questions or would like to contact any of our speakers or other attendees that you spoke with earlier. Be sure if you're making any social media tweets, um, you can tweet part of hashtag International Youth Day, uh, which was yesterday, um, or hashtag or I Y C 2021. And or hashtag I on the future, which was our theme of the past two days of focusing on the future and bringing hope. And truly, after these two days, I'm feeling filled with, with hope and optimism, not only for research, but also from the amazing young people in this community that truly have a wealth of knowledge and insight to offer. And I really am very excited for where this group moves in the near future. Look forward to staying in touch. And that's a wrap. Thank you all and take care. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank bye, you. Everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Really bye, everyone. Thank bye. you. Bye bye.